Any system of slavery, particularly slavery in the New World, is a system in which human beings are property. They are owned. They are therefore considered to be like oxen or cows or animals or land. They are property. After the Haitian Revolution, as we all know, in the 1820s, 1825 to be precise, the French demanded reparations for their, what they consider their property. They said, give us money, not just for the planters, for the plantations we own that grow sugar. They said, give us money for the slaves that we owned. And what is the fascinating thing is that when they were negotiating this, they were negotiating this with former slaves. In other words, they were looking at people the way I'm looking at you and saying, give me money for you being a slave a couple of years, a couple of years back. Right? And that's extraordinary. And what the French said is that give us that money um, and we will recognize you. So that therefore here was a country, and let's think about it, that had defeated, had abolished slavery, had become independent from French colonialism, was, was existed in a sea when it looked to the right, when it looked to the left, to the north, to the south, everybody around them had slaves. Therefore, they could not succeed. They were in what we call a boycott. Both they were in a, they were an economic boycott and they were in diplomatic isolation. And they were trying to find a way out of economic boycott and diplomatic isolation. The French says, give us back, pay us back for the property, including the slaves that we lost, and we will then recognize you, which will then open the door for other diplomatic um, recognition and economic uh, trade. And uh, the ex-slaves who were in power decided that they, this is what they needed to do. But in doing that, they also bankrupt their treasury. These reflections on violence have made us realize the frequent discrepancy between the cadres of the Nationalist Party and the masses and the way they are out of step with each other. In any union or political organization, there is a traditional gap between the masses who demand an immediate, unconditional improvement of their situation and the cadres who, gauging the difficulties likely to, to be created by employees, put a restraint on their demands. Hence, the oft-remarked tenacious discontent of the masses with regard to the cadres after a day of demonstrations while the cadres are celebrating victory the masses well and truly get the feeling that they have been betrayed. It is the repeated demonstrations of for their rights and the repeated labor disputes that politicize the masses. A politically informed union official is someone who knows that a local dispute is not a crucial confrontation between him and the management. The colonized individuals who in their respective who in their respective metropolises have studied the mechanism of political parties, established similar organizations so as to mobilize the masses and put pressure on the colonial administration. The formation of nationalist parties in the colonized countries is contemporary with the birth of an intellectual and business elite. These elite attach primordial importance to the organization as such as blind devotion to the organization. As blind devotion to the organization often takes priority over a rational study of colonial society. The notion of party is a notion imported from the metropolis. This instrument of modern resistance is grafted onto a protein, unbalanced reality where slavery, bondage, barter, cottage industries, and stock transactions exist side by side. Happy Monday, happy Monday, happy Monday. Welcome back to On the Shoulders of Giants. I am Joseph Ward, and I am continuing my reading and review of Franz Fanon's book, Wretched of the Earth. This is chapter three, excuse me, chapter two. Yeah, chapter two, Grandeur and Weakness of Spontaneity. So chapter one was on violence, talking about violence as a means to liberate yourself from your oppressors. In the book specifically, he's talking about African countries being able to liberate themselves from their colonizers. But he also is getting into the later part, the latter part of chapter one, he's getting into what colonialism is, what anti-colonialism is, and what happens in the decolonialism part, what happens after colonialism. 
or is there truly an after colonialism? And that's what we're getting into in chapter two, grandeur and weakness of spontaneity, starting on chapter on page 63, excuse me. Is there truly an a after colonialism for small poor nations who were who were colonized by European powers? Being colonized by these European powers, what happens after? So now we're getting into what I just read, the part I just read and uh to open up this chapter, right? So we are free and we are working to build ourselves as a nation. So as we are building ourselves as a nation, there are things we need. The problem is the things that we need, we have to go back to the colonizers to get the things that we need. So in order to get the things that we need, truly the colonizers would have to have some kind of influence of some sort on how we run our countries. And it is through this influence, along with the long lasting effects of colonization that will shape the classes of the people, because he's talking about an elite, an elite class, a class of elite people, a class of nationalists and the masses, the masses, the everyday people, even the criminals, the masses, all three factions should be working together as one but because of the effects of colonialism and because of because of the lasting effects of colonialism and because of the need for resources so now we have new influence of <clears throat> the new influence of colonialism now we're looking at these three groups the the elite the bourgeois the nationalists and the masses they're working separately they're working as individual pieces and then working as individual pieces. They're a fraction. And when you're a fraction, you're weakened. And especially when you're going against a greater power. And remember, we're in the mindset of war is what we will use to free ourselves until we learn something new. So let's jump back into it. Page 64, the first paragraph. The weakness of political parties lies not only in their mechanism, in their mechanical imitation of an organization which is used to handling the struggle of the proletariat within the highly industrialized capitalist society. Innovations and adaptations should have been made as to the type of organization at a local level. The great mistake, the inherent flaw of most political parties in the undeveloped regions has been traditionally to address, first and foremost, the most politically conscious elements of the urban proletariat the small tradesmen, the civil servicemen, i.e. the tiny section of the population, which represents barely more than 1%. Hence, although this proletariat understood, understood the party propaganda and read its publications, it was much less prepared to respond to any slogans taking up the unrelenting struggle for national liberation. It has been said many times that in colonial territories, the proletariat is the colonel of the colonized people most pampered by the colonial regime. The embryonic urban proletariat is relatively privileged. In the capitalist countries, the proletariat has nothing to lose and possibly everything to gain. In the colonized countries, the proletariat has everything to lose. It represents, in fact, that fraction of the colonized who are indispensable for running the, the colonial regime because they are the taxi drivers, the train drivers, the miners, the dockers, the interpreters, the nurses, the the blue collar class, the the proletariats are the everyday working people, the blue collar class. So these elements make up the most loyal clientele of the nationalist parties, and by the privileged position they occupy in the colonial system, represent the bourgeois fraction of the colonized population. So it is understandable. Oh, excuse me, my bad. So. Um, so he's getting into he's getting into the ideological form the ideological formation of these parties of these groups in their infancy because he's talking about in the embryonic stage so in their in their beginning stages 
how their ideologies are being shaped, what ideologies they have, where the ideologies come from, and how the ideologies will be employed to move forward. Because remember, these groups are working to empower themselves. These groups are working to get the best advantage for themselves, still working independently because of the colonial influence pre and post colonialism. All right. So the large majority of the nationalist parties regard the rural masses with great mistrust. These masses give them the impression of being mirrored in inertia and sterility. Fairly quickly, the Nationalist Party's members, the urban workers and intellectuals, end up passing the same pejorative judgment on the peasantry as the colonists. So now these uh, these Nationalist Parties, they are getting some kind of influence, some kind of esteem. And still with the influence of the colonists, they now begin to look at the rest of their people the same way the colonists do. And he's talking about the peasantry. So he's talking about the lower class, the poor class people. So now we have classism along with racism. So those who are of higher classes are looking down on each other, on looking down on that. Those of higher classes are looking down on those who they consider to be of lower status. And they're looking down on them through the lens of Europeans. In our endeavor to understand the reasons for this distrust of the rural masses by the political parties, we should not forget that colonialism has often strengthened or established this, dom this domination by an organized perfection of the peasantry. Regimented by marabouts, witch doctors, and traditional chiefs, the rural masses still live in a feudal state whose, over whose overbearingly medieval structure is nurtured by the colonial administrators and army. So this is another key. This is another stream. Because remember, we're talking about the, <clears throat> the elite, the nationalist, and the masses, the peasantry, the proletariats. There's colonial influence for all three fractions. Colonial influence for all of them. And the colonists have found a way to, well, the colonists have found use for all three groups. And all three groups see, see an advantage for themselves in dealing with the colonists. So they use their influence the best that they know how, the best that they can to be able to gain what they can because everybody's fighting for scraps because now they're in a state of scarcity. So living in the state of scarcity, everybody's fighting for scraps and the crumbs are coming from one table. So everybody's going to do what they need to do to get these crumbs off this one table. Remember, yes, these groups are starting to look at each other as enemies. This is the beginning of them really tearing each other apart. This is the beginning of them really going at each other. This is the beginning of of uh, further destabilization of newly freed nations. Now we're going to look at each other as enemies. We are going to Willie Lynch's and we're going to find the differences and exploit the differences between these groups. Because now go ahead and make them fight against each other. They're fighting against each other. Shoot, they make it easy for us to get to what we need to get. We can put, we can place the the people or the person in the right positions that we need to get to what we need to keep the influence that we have. All right. The young national bourgeois, especially the business sector, now competes with these feudal rulers in a number of areas. Marabouts and witch doctors prevent the sick from consulting a physician. The rulings of the, of the gemmas make lawyers re redundant. The Cades use their political and administrative powers to launch a trucking business or establish a commerce. The local chiefs oppose the introduction of trade and new products in the name of religion and tradition. So now we got fighting amongst the groups, right? The young class of colonized businessmen and traders needs to eliminate these prohibitions and barriers in order to grow. The indigenous clientele, which represents the, the exclusive preserve of the feudal overlords and sees itself more or less banned from purchasing new products constitutes therefore a market which both parties are fighting over. The feudal agents from a barrier 
is feudal agents form a barrier between the young Western westernized nationalists and the masses. Every time the elite makes a gesture toward the rural masses, the tribal chiefs, the religious rulers, and the traditional authorities issue repeated warnings, threats, and excommunications. These traditional authorities, sanctioned by the occupying power, feel threatened by the growing endeavors of the elite to infiltrate the rural masses. They know too well that the ideas imported by these urban elements are likely to threaten their very existence of their feudal authority. As a result, the enemy is not the occupying power with whom, in fact, they get along with very well. But these modernists who are bent on dislocating the indigenous society and in doing so take the bread out of their mouths. They're not even focusing on the real enemy. They're focusing on themselves because they've been broken down and everybody's fighting for scraps. Everybody's fighting for power, influence. Some are, some are fighting to maintain influence, maintain the influence and power that has been given to them by the colonists. 